Coucou. There we go. Wonderful. Have we officially started? We good to go? Yes, Everyone. we have. Mm -hmm. All right, wonderful. Sorry. <laughs> Tech troubles, figuring them out. So good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Wolmerink, and welcome back to our daily lunch and learn. Uh, a couple of just introduce myself and to introduce what we're doing today. Uh, like I said, my name is Eric. I've been with Decisions for, I think, eight and a half years now. I'd have to go actually check my hair date. Uh, but I've been here a while. I, I've grown with the company. I've gotten to join when we were relatively small, starting out um, with just a couple of us and actually a pool house behind the Big Boss's, uh, Big Boss's main house and gotten to see us grow to be this enterprise level software that we offer today. So I've worn many hats over the years. Uh, I've done support. I've done professional services. Uh, I originally started writing actually as a junior developer, writing some code. And for about the past four or five years, I've really focused in on training and actually uh, got to go on site training our customers on how to use the product and the best practices and how to basically implement decisions in your environment. But currently, I've actually this year, I've switched over to the product team. And what I'm doing over here is I'm helping kind of guide product direction and roadmap. So I own the roadmap. I meet with our customers and partners uh, to understand needs and feature requests and really just make sure that decisions continues to be uh, one of the most capable and accessible tools out there. So that's kind of my role. That's what I do. That's what I'm passionate about. And today I'll just be answering your questions and helping guide you in the right direction with anything you have. Uh, so like I said, welcome. This is the Lunch and Learn. If this is your first time attending or you're watching this recording, what the Lunch and Learn is, is it is a daily hour uh, on our lunch break here at Decisions where you get to sit with a decisions expert of some area of the product and ask any questions you want. Nothing's off limits here. You can ask about the company. You can ask about our history. You can ask about your projects. You can ask about blockers you have or how to do something. Uh, a lot of times these sessions are used to help uh, demonstrate either features you're not familiar with or if you're stuck on or have a question on something on how to do something we can resolve that or, or take a look at it here and if we can't we'll definitely uh, follow up after this call and point you in the right direction um, so yeah we do these every day Monday through Thursday at least uh, not on Fridays and we skipped obviously this Monday for the fourth of July holiday uh, but yeah feel free to attend pass the word around to your coworkers and colleagues or anyone who may be interested to ask some questions of the decisions folks here um that, that you would like to get answered so yeah if you would like to ask questions there's a couple ways to do it you can post them in the chat or the q a panel on the zoom call you can click those buttons and type them in if you would like or additionally if you go to the attendees panel there's a little option there to raise your hand and if you click the raise hand button uh, we actually can take you off mute and you can ask your question uh verbally if that's easier as well and so I'll give you guys a minute to start thinking about your questions and typing them out or, or raising your hand if you want to ask them. And with uh, without further ado, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. We did have one pre-submitted question that came in, uh, which is all around action and visibility rules. So I'm going to start with that one. If nothing else comes in, let me actually grab the chat panel, make sure I didn't miss anything. I don't believe I have. Uh, so I'll start with the pre-submitted question. But like I said, please feel free to uh, chime in here if you want. So the question that came in ahead of time, it says, when you create an action and visibility rule for an item in a process folder, the visibility rule gets called several times when you perform a right-click action on the stored process ent entry. Uh, is it possible to limit that call to only one time? Hmm. Uh, I took a look at this question and started to build it out locally a little bit to see if I could recreate this, this behavior. Uh, but right off the bat, it feels feels maybe a little bit like a bug, and this is something we'll investigate together. Um, but yeah, uh, normally, and I'm guessing the way you determined this was by maybe running the global debugger and seeing how many times that visibility rule was called or running the profiler pot potentially to see how many times that item was called during uh, kind of during a right click action. So uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try it locally. I'll, I'll show you where I got to before uh, the call. I only spent a couple minutes on it. And let's see if we can figure this out. But if it is, then that's something I'll submit to the dev team and ask them and say, hey, is there something we're doing incorrectly here, maybe making too many calls to this visibility rule? So what I've done, this is my local install. And by the way, this is on version 8.2, which is the current uh, current version of decisions. Is it 8.2? Hold on, let me double check. 8.2, OK, correct. Had to double check really quick. Uh, so I'm on the latest version of decisions here, which you may see a couple different UI changes or some some differences if you were on version seven or earlier. 
Uh, but all I've done, I created a little folder here and created a couple of things. I have a really simple flow execution extension, which ties to a process folder. It is called purchase request. It only has three fields on it, name, amount, and date, uh, just to get some things inside of there. What I've done then is I created a flow that helps me create some of these things in my folder. So all it does is it really just runs, all this flow is really simple. All it does is it runs the setup process folder. And if you're unfamiliar with flow execution extensions, this is how you start to save process data. You, you set up a place, a folder, for it to start storing and tracking all the information about the execution of the flow. And then I run a state set state and percent complete step just so that I can get some data in there. And then lastly, what I was working on right before this call is I created a really simple form actually in the simple form designer, which takes the name, amount, and date and allows me to just view them. And I'm gonna tie that to a user action. So again, if you're just to keep everyone on the same page, if you're unfamiliar, what you can do with data that's stored in decisions with entities and, and process data and all these sorts of things is you actually get this configuration folder, which allows you to write user actions and, and, and state triggers. If the data hits a certain state, you can run flows that do work on it. Uh, and all I've done is I wrote a flow that just says check details. So wherever I see one of my PR uh, purchase requests, and interestingly enough, I don't, oh, because I already wrote the, the filter action. I should see a flow or a, 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 an action called check details. And what check details does is it allows me to run that a little subflow that shows that form I built. Um, and then lastly, this is where I just got to, is I wrote that visibility rule to help kind of drive into the question. And so the, all this visibility rule does and says, who's the initiating user, which in my case is admin, just admin at decisions.com. It's the default admin administrator account. And if it is, then filter out the action called check details. Um, so just to make sure that this works, I'm actually gonna change this a little bit, make sure I go see my action very quickly. And actually it shouldn't matter if this rule uh, passes or fails to be honest, um, it should still work. But now when I right click this, um, I'm not seeing my action. So I must've done something wrong. Uh, Either way, maybe we're, I gotta check something out there. I, I would expect to see my action here. Let me create another purchase request just to test. We'll say we have a $1,200 headset this time. Uh, requesting it yesterday, someone requested this, go. And I see this here. Yeah, not seeing my custom action, which is interesting. I'm wondering if my rule's doing something that I uh, am not intending. But either way, let's dive into the question. The question is, is when you perform a right-click action on your stored data, such as when I right-click here and see these actions over here, uh, that visibility rule is running multiple times. How would I know that? How would I determine uh, whether or not that's the case? Well, in version seven and eight, there's a tool you can use called the global debugger. The global debugger, uh, if, you're, if you're familiar with the normal debugger, the normal debugger allows you to take a flow or a rule and run just that, that thing, just that element in the, a, a test environment where you can put in some data, you can see how it executes, watch it run, see the inputs and outputs and stuff, et cetera. But for things like an action visibility rule, that's really a, a rule or a flow that runs globally, uh, it runs on the main portal. How do you test something like that? Well, we've enabled something over here. If you go to the bottom left under tools, you'll see this action here called show global debugger. And this will pop open a new tab. And the moment I click this toggle on, it'll start debugging all actions and all flows and all rules and reports and, and dashboards and anything that runs for the entire portal. So you gotta be careful with the global debugger because it's gonna start tracking everything. So you don't wanna run this for a long time, but you can do something like this where you can turn it on. And then I can click over, take my right click action, go back to my debugger and turn it off and see if it can. So I didn't see my flow run, which is interesting. Let me make sure the global debugger is working. Click over, let's go run a flow. Just run it, not debug it. Put in some more data here. Throw some test data, say run. Go back to the global debugger. Okay, that's what I was expecting to see the first time where I can see my purchase request flow that run. And it looks like a bunch of uh, some flows that kind of run in the portal to check icon images, which is fine. They're really small, light flows. Okay, let me dive back over here. Let me check my, let's just delete this rule. I may have done something weird on my rule. But over here, I have my action visibility flow, which all it does is for a user action says, show my form, shows the data, and then closes this form. It doesn't actually save it to the database. I delete that rule, do you work? No. Interesting. I must have done something really, really wrong. 
Do I see it in here? No, I do not. Okay, okay, fascinating. Let's try this one more way. Maybe it's not showing on this because this is the default folder actions. Let's go ahead and create a report of my items because uh, this actually will show the user or the action context for the data. This might work. Okay, okay. Purchase request report. Oops, sorry. Let's go report on purchase requests. Let's add fields here for the things that I care about, which in my case were my name and my amount and my submitted date. Oh, oh my gosh, I am so silly. I know exactly why this isn't working. Uh, cool. Uh, let me just finish this here, which a request date is what I called it. R. R, R, R. There we go. Cool. So here's how I figured this out. I have no data in this report, meaning that my purchase request data is not getting saved to the database. And this is because I was trying to build this too fast. And when I use my create feature request step under setup process folder, I'm actually not saving my extension data. Uh, I was just creating a generic process folder that tracks just the generic data about the process and doesn't actually save my specific data. So that would make sense. Let's go ahead and start tracking purchase request data. Uh, which I hand in from the start step so I could pass that whole object in. Now, when I run my flow, the purchase request number four should save this request data to the database. Cool. Uh, this time we're going to ask for a $250 chair. Request on today. Go ahead. Cool. Aha. Perfect. Now I see my action. Wonderful. Okay. I feel much better about myself. I was, I was going a little crazy there. Uh, but you can see here, this is the, the first three requests that aren't tied to my purchase request data, don't have my custom action, but my fourth one here that is, has my check deal details actions, shows my form, shows all the information here, good to go. Now, let's go back to my purchase request configuration folder and create that visibility rule. Uh, vis oh, sorry, over here. Action visibility rules uh, really are just hide and show action rules that allow you to show or hide actions based on any condition, either based on the user, the groups they're a part of, or what the data has inside of it. You can show actions based on the certain data that's part of your object, whatever. You can write a rule that takes any part of that, that information and determines when to show actions. So we're going to say hide action or show details or check details. And these rules are relatively simple to set up. They really, uh, if it returns true, it's going to filter out or not show the action. And so first you're gonna say, what action are you trying to hide? So I'm either hiding the action by what category it's a part of or what the name is. Uh, so if I say if the action name is, check details. Cool. Uh, I guess I could leave it like that because that's just going to run. Uh, but normally you would add another another set of conditions here. So if the action is check details and uh, the initiating user's email, you know, equals the admin account, admin at decisions.com, or maybe they're part of a certain group or whatever. Um, maybe you're looking at the data of the, the purchase request itself. Doesn't matter. All I know is that now I jump back to purchase request four where that action was previously being shown, action's not shown. Okay, now I'm at a testable state. So let's go back over here. I'm gonna turn the global debugger back on. I'm going to right click here, which means that the action should have run. And then I come back over here. Ooh, and I say off and I see exactly what you're talking about. Looks like that that action was run, ooh, 10 to 15 times here. Um, yeah, so 100% correct. Now, I, I, I understand based off of what this is looking at here, why, uh, why you see this run so many times in the debugger. And it's because what it's looking at is it's running this rule for every single action on your right-click actions. So you see here is manage permissions, check details, no. Is move folder to root, check details, no. And so on and so forth. All of these are the actions that pop up in that right-click context menu. But I understand the concern as well, because now when I right-click on this thing, um, you know, I see a, a good 20 executions of a rule uh, potentially that are running unnecessarily. So in short to answer your question, no, there's no really way uh, right off the bat to say, hey, let's not run all of these 
uh, you know, only run this for the act, my action, don't run this for every single action that's out there. It looks like it's trying to run for every action in that context menu. Um, so I'm gonna do a couple things here. One is I'm going to report this to the dev team as a potential uh, performance impact. If you had a lot of these action rules, say I had 10 of them, I'm running 10 times however many we see on my screen here for every right click action. Uh, one thing to help hopefully put your mind a little bit at these is these are these are millisecond runs. These, these types of statement rules are so simple that they become really, really insignificant. But uh, I think there may be something performance wise we can do here. The other thing we're doing is we're actually reworking all that context menu that's coming towards the end of the year. Uh, so you'll see that context menu change a little bit, not quite as many actions there, but that's that's neither here nor there. So great catch by whoever submitted this. Uh, looks like it was submitted by um, Janice. Janice, thank you very much. Um, I do think maybe we're doing a little bit of excessive rule executions here and we will take a look, but uh, even if you're not familiar with this, maybe you learned something about the global debugger action visibility rules and how they work. So. Great catch, and I will have to check with the dev team and follow up on you after this call. So wonderful. All right, cool. Good catch, good catch. That's fun. I like building uh, quick prototypes like that. All right, uh, let me look at the chat and everything. I don't see any questions coming in. If I miss it, uh, please maybe type it again. I have a question. Ah, Ben. Oh, Benjamin Weatherford. Not sure if we can allow you to, to ask your question. <laughs> um, sorry, Ben is a Ben is an old colleague and a good friend. Yeah, I am very rude. Wonderful, sir. If you want to come off mute, we can. Um, I think we can allow you to chat somehow. I think you have chat. If you want to come up, you can go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, can you hear me? Mm hmm. Howdy, sir. Good to see you again. Hey, Eric. Up, yeah, Eric? good to see you too from the other side of the fence. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so quick question, uh, and I actually just submitted it to support because I wasn't entirely sure if we had any documentation on this. Uh, when you create a data type slash integration, uh, the open API integration type, do you happen to know what URL is required for the uh, for that service reference? Oh, I guess I don't have any test data here. I don't know what you the URL, the, the reference. So when you're calling... What URL are you looking for? Well, yeah. So I assume that this open API service reference was different from like the rest one, because mm -hmm. I assume this one was you set up like a, a swagger library or like an open, open API kind of setup, And then you just point the URL to uh, just whatever, <laughs> whatever is the definition URL. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know for sure, because I've tried sure. a few things I can't find. Correct. Yeah, this should point to like, and again, I know this conceptually. I'm I'm pretty much in the same boat you are. That you point this to the definition of the API steps, right, or of the open API, whatever. I forget what the what they call it. Whatever that format is. I think it's just XML. But um, yeah, I whatever.com is not going to return anything, obviously. Uh, yeah. yeah, I I don't know, and I'm sure you already did this, but I'll check the documentation as well. Um, nope. Nope. I did, scary. but I wasn't sure if uh, if it might be called something else. So if, if it's all right, it's if you don't, that's uh, yeah. Not a big deal. I'm I'm I utterly cannot help you. I don't know off the top of my head because I haven't used uh, this this reference yet. Yeah, open ID either. is no worries. Open ID. Yeah, that's for the single sign on stuff. Okay, okay. Yeah, I don't know, bud. Sorry, I wish I could uh, right. be more support helpful. But... Support will be forced to get back to me. <laughs> yeah, let me, I can go kick him too. Except I'm not in the office today, but. And go pretend yeah. to kick them. Thanks, Eric. <laughs> hey, ben. Don't be a stranger, man. Well, I won't be. Oh. I'll go ask someone who's better at open API than I am. All right, cool. What other questions does anyone have? Hopefully ones uh, that don't stump me. I'm I'm over two today. That's not a that's not a good lunch and learn so far. Someone throw me a softball. How do you create an account? Sorry, no, okay, <laughs> I can answer this. That's good. All right, cool. Um, well, I still got plenty of time. What I'll do, let's do this. Uh, I do have our product roadmap up and ready to talk about. Let me let me just talk about a couple of things coming down the road for those on the call that may or may not be exciting. Ben, I'd actually, I'd actually, since you're on the call and I can call you out directly, I'd love to hear some of your opinions on this. Maybe we can set up a call after, or uh, we can talk about this later. But 
Let me talk about a couple of things coming down the pipeline that are really important to decisions. I'm actually going to jump back a few slides in this presentation. Uh, that are really important to what the future decisions is going to look like and how it's going to behave. Um, so a lot of things happening here, and I'll, I'll look at the roadmap a little more specifically. But let's talk about these things. Uh, yeah, version eight is out. If you're not familiar, version eight is a huge, huge release for us because it changes one core thing about decisions, which is how we are hosted. Uh, or rather one of our hosting options that you can install decisions to. So normally or traditionally, you've been only been able to install decisions on a Windows server with a SQL Server backend. Uh, we first removed the SQL Server requirement by adding Postgres support. So now you can install to Microsoft SQL Server or a Postgres database, and that's in version seven and eight. And in version eight, now you can install instead of to a Windows operating system to a Linux container, which is a much more flexible, much more lightweight uh, hosting kind of uh, setup. So you can install to a lightweight container, and that allows you to dynamically scale both horizontally with more nodes in a cluster uh, very quickly or vertically by adding more resources and taking down resources significantly faster. Uh, it drops your hosting cost by, by about 40% uh, based on the traditional model. So that was a huge change for us. And it took us a couple of years uh, to rewrite the underlying architecture and code to get it to this point. So what does that look like for the rest of the year? How does that impact us moving forward? Well, the big things we're going to be focusing on now is the designer experience and performance. So the two things we're targeting moving forward are continuing to improve the speed, scalability, and flexibility of decisions while also improving the overall designer and user experience to make things a lot better. And so one initiative for that latter half for, the, uh, for making the designer experience better is we're fixing and rewriting a lot that is currently uh, struggling. People are struggling with the repository. We're going to be renaming it the deployment server, and I'll talk about that in a sec. And we're going to we're going to change the way that developers kind of conceptualize and build work and decisions by tying them all to projects. And we're going to add this new project view as part of the designer experience. So what this is going to look like is when a user logs in, no longer is it going to be a massive monolithic folder tree like you see in the screenshot on the left hand side, which is a bunch of work that the developers are expected to maintain and organize and keep track of. That is now going to be broken out into discrete projects, or you can think of them as boxes where all the work is going to be contained inside of. It allows us to do a couple things. It allows us to, I'm going to skip a few screenshots, allows us to organize work uh, a little bit better, it allows us to run uh, more discrete flows as part of the process, like checking the health of a project to understand what, what, how uh, best practices are applied, whether you have unit tests applied or if there's validation issues or, or missing dependencies or, or flows in error handling. And then it allows us to deploy these things significantly better. So project view is coming. And you'll see on the left-hand side, you still have your folder tree. Uh, but when you log in, you'll now see a, a, a some big boxes of all the projects you have access to, and you enter into that project. And inside of here, we'll do some default organization for you. You can create your own organization folder tree, but everything's going to be contained inside the project. So a couple of ways that changes the developer experience is one, now when you're building, you're only going to see and experience things that are inside your project or, a, or uh, that your project is tied directly to via dependency. So when you go to add a data type to your flow or you, you have a create data step and you choose a data type, when you go to the data type selection screen, it no longer will be every Every data type in the system across all projects. It will be only the data types inside your project. Same for calling subflows and forms. You go to pick a, sub, a subflow and you'll only see a subflow that's part of your project that you're currently working on. Uh, again, or if you add dependencies that, that you can see other work as well. But we're trying to constrain a little bit of the user experience to keep the experience cleaner, to keep your work more organized, and then to directly impact the way you deploy your work from one server to another. Now, with everything being constrained inside of its own project, and we know where it lives, we know how it's all tied together, deployment becomes a lot more solid and a lot more consistent with less errors and dependency checking and, and cross-project dependencies being an issue. Uh, a lot less of that is happening. The other side of the deployment coin that we're also uh, hoping to solve is that deployment should no longer be developer-centric and server-centric. I should not as a developer have to log in to prod and pull a project down and then hopefully it just works. It's all going to be proper deployment where from a, you know, I'm going to go to the deployment server, I'm going to have a project there, and I'm going to say, deploy this thing to prod. And that deployment should be automated. Uh, it should send all the work there. It should run its automated unit tests. It should report back to me. 
but it should be more of a CI CD pipeline. We see deployments as more of an IT ops kind of uh, act, action or operation rather than a developer operation. And so those are the two things we're really, really focusing on for the next year, along with some rework around um, some, some database integration stuff. And in the future, early next year, some flow designer rework as well, where we're kind of reconceptualizing the steps and how you interact with them, how you can create subflows from groupings of steps, and more importantly, how you visualize and map data across multiple steps um, instead, of, uh, instead of just having less capability to do so. So some really cool things coming down the pipeline, uh, and you'll see them kind of uh, reflected here. So. Let me talk about this for just a minute so you guys can see some of the, the, the tasks coming down the pipeline and what we're working on, um, what we've been doing towards the early part of this year. But starting in quarter three, because that's where we officially are now. Uh, quarter three now starts with, uh, what are we looking at? Sorry, project view and deployment server. Those are the two big ones for quarter three we're really heavily focusing. Uh, we're hoping by the end of this quarter to start seeing some of the effects of that come out in your, in your installs. So by about 8.5, you should see some of that work come out. A couple other things we're doing here, though, is we're moving some of the execution of the portal uh, client side. So actually, things like action visibility rules, which I showed a little bit earlier, uh, are now going to run client side rather than server side, which means that uh, for anyone less technical, uh, those rules should run on your browser, like as part of your user experience, rather than running on the server and then reporting to the user, which is going to increase overall UI responsiveness and performance. Uh, and then also it's going to, yeah, definitely improve a lot of the performance there. Some other things we're doing here as well is as we're kind of reevaluating how projects are organized, we're going to put some better uh, administrative reporting and dashboarding. So the system page, which currently is a little unusable, is going to get a whole rework and look a lot better and cleaner and have some more usable reports. And so a lot of that stuff's coming in quarter three. Uh, in quarter four, what we're going to try to do also with Project View is help fix, if you look at RD96, help fix data type switching. Uh, right now, as some of you may be well aware, data types are very inflexible in the sense that you have to choose a data type and that's what you're stuck with. You want to change the properties or change uh, what structure you're using, you can't. Uh, unfortunately, you have to create a brand new one and then go back and retroactively change, make all those changes. Now, uh, we're either going to add attributes to the structures that say, I want this database stored or I want this stored in the decisions folder tree or whatever it may be. And you can turn those on and off or we'll just allow you to switch data structures and all the mapping will maintain this will be uh, maintained and keep itself consistent. So. We're going to be looking at that towards the end of the year and then you'll see some of that flow designer restuff down on the bottom right that i showed the screenshot for uh, start to come out at the end of the year as well uh, if you have any questions on any of those rnd tasks feel free to speak up and we can talk a little bit more about it uh, but moving into next year some things that we're going to be doing one thing i'm really excited about is a non-edit experience for for designers so right now, if I wanted to look at a flow and visualize all that data, you kind of saw that that's something we care about. Um, I can't. You can either see that the flow exists in the portal, or you can have proper edit access to go in and make significant changes to it. We think there's a permission level somewhere in the middle where you want a developer, you want someone to be able to open a flow and click through the steps and see the data and debug it and make sure that it works, but you don't want to allow them to save any significant changes. So we're gonna have a non-edit designer experience, which means that you can go into flows and click through them and see them, but you actually can't click the save button. Nothing you do, you can't make any significant changes to the process itself. Uh, so that's gonna be something we target for early next year. And since we're already looking at this capability of, uh, you know, a new edit experience or a new kind of ex uh, designer experience. Uh, we're also going to explore potentially having multiple users exist in a single process or a single flow and be able to work on the flow at the same time. Uh, I know there's some considerations and concerns there, so that's something we'll be evaluating towards the beginning of next year and see if that's something we want to add. And then as the year goes on, we're really going to be focusing heavily on kind of uh, cleaning up some some of the designer experience and user experience and making things a little bit more accessible. So some things like uh, removing removing features or things that are not best practice or potentially cause uh, low scale um, or you know low ability to scale are things we care about. Improving the entire debugger experience around how the debugger runs, adding breakpoints uh, or the ability to choose certain sets of data or variables and make sure they they transition and move appropriately. 
uh, just a lot more tools for the developer and designer to say, hey, we're going to make sure your process is rock solid and works the way it should be working. Um, so yeah, a lot's coming over the next next year that we're planning to add to the product on some really cool things. Uh, keep in mind that these slides are part of a, a broader presentation we give related to our product roadmap. Uh, I actually personally give that presentation every other Thursday. Uh, so if you're interested in joining any of those, you can shoot me an email, ericdecisions.com, or uh, you can shoot your CSM an email or support an email. They'll know how to get in touch with me to get you added to those calls. But yeah, it's every other Thursday, and I go through this roadmap in a little bit more detail, a little bit more intentionality about the why and the, uh, and, and the hows of what we're going to be doing here. So. Uh, but some really cool stuff's coming. I'm, I'm I'm super excited about Project View. I think it's going to really uh, kind of uh, change the way developers conceptualize and build projects for the better uh, so that things become a lot more consistent uh, with a lot more best practices applied out of the box. So some really cool stuff's coming. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. Uh, here's the local box. You can stop that. That's good to go. Cool. Any other questions at the moment that you want to, anyone would like to ask or type in the chat or that you can uh, provide? Going once. All right. Uh, well, cool. Well, that's all I had today. So, yep. Keep in mind, tell this to your colleagues. Please feel free to join future Lunch and Learns. Ben, it was great to see you, sir. Uh, I'd love to catch up next time I'm in town, but um, otherwise, I hope you all have a wonderful day. Enjoy, enjoy your, what is today? Wednesday. <laughs> uh, have a good week, and we will catch you at the next lunch. Learn. So take care, everyone. Have a good day.